Carl here from Metal Money, and today I'm very fortunate to be speaking to a brilliantly talented musician, photographer, the once vocalist for the chart top in Chimera, and a brave advocate for mental health and awareness, offering his own personal journey to the cause, as well as director Nick Cavalier, who the two guys together have produced a wonderful documentary entitled Down Again. And I am beyond stoked to be here today with none other than himself and Mark Hunter. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with me today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, my pleasure's all mine, guys. So to delve straight into it, we're here today to talk about the short documentary you've created uh, entitled Down Again. And first of all, it's a wonderfully heartfelt, honest, and refreshing watch, guys. So first of all, congratulations to you both on that. Cheers. Glad you feel that it's refreshing. Uh, dude, yeah, very thanks. much so. Very much so, guys. So you guys met on a panel uh, speaking about mental health and creativity when Nick, you approached Mark about making this film of which Mark you're obviously the heart of. And for those who may not be aware of what it's about, could you tell us in your own words what you guys wanted to do with Down Again? Uh, yeah, I'll take this one, Mark. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I, Mark and I met on that panel and he told most of the story that's in the doc when we were there so i really just wanted it to be about that and what was the thing that drew me to it was sort of how he much like myself used his talents whether it's in photography or in previously in that music to sort of express himself and sort of you know maintain the demons like you know <laughs> exercise the demons you know of course, man, of course. And, you know, you know, mental health can often fall under subject matter, you know, that is considered taboo, and those who struggle with their own personal, you know, mental health issues find themselves often stigmatized for it. And, you know, many are often afraid to even share that they have anxiety, something everyone deals with, uh, you know, at different levels every day in fear of being, you know, deemed lesser than or different or so on. But this conversation has been around for a while, and I'm wondering, do you guys see a wider understanding or acceptance beginning to take shape, or do you feel there's still a long way to go in that regard, or, or both? I think that it's um, a little of both. It depends probably on the area that you that you might live in. And I was actually surprised to see how long this has been kind of talked about. There's some articles, if you just re type in hypomania, for example, which is what uh, I have. <clears throat> there are some awesome articles in mainstream press going back about 12 years. And they were referring to it as CEO disease and kind of like Steve Jobs type mentality where these people are kind of driven but also have some inner demons um and like steve jobs i'll compare myself to steve jobs just so you think <laughs> um but yeah so i thought that was pretty cool that was for me it's um i think it's just kind of area like some people in some areas especially the town i live in is a little more small town rural uh, you're probably not going to get these kind of deep conversations, but when you're hanging around artists and other uh, outliers, if you will, it seems to be more and more accepted and a little more and more talked about, especially in lyrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I wish I shared that optimism. I mean, I do to a certain extent, but there's I, I do a lot of work with the military community as well, I've done some work with uh, veterans and, and things like that. And I think any culture or subculture that has like bravado first, you know, as the, mm -hmm. as a more important thing, I think that's really where there's an issue. I mean, I would imagine that's why it's been an issue in the metal community, you know, that it's perceived as like, these are some tough guys and, you know, mm -hmm. and that, and the rock community. And I think it's, it, I wouldn't say there's a, as much as a stigma. I think in that way, I'm very, uh, I think optimistic, but I just think it's a more of a personal accountability within the culture, you know? I think a lot of people are afraid to talk about it because it's, it makes them look like they're weak-minded, like that term, right? But mm -hmm. they're not. I mean, if you can't control it, there's nothing weak about it. It's sort of like, I look at it like the X-Men. You've got to embrace your different and use that power in some way to benefit yourself, you know? I love that. And in the documentary, Mark, you, you explain that, you know, art is a catharsis for you and that outside of that, th th there are other means such as therapy and, you know, medication that helps uh, some more than others from person to person. 
Uh, and in some cases, in my experience, you know, one of the symptoms of bipolar that can become an you know an incredibly prominent prominent one is is denial. You know, um, a, a, you know, a denial born of not being able to sec accept when something is not as it should be. You know, personally, romantically, professionally, whatever it may be. And sometimes to the point where there's a defensiveness that brings a contrived, even sometimes fictitious reasoning behind the thinking until it gets to a point you know, where it can escalate. But you, right from the outset of the documentary in the introduction, explained that you actually wanted to deal with those darkest moments. And for me, that was a really, really cool thing to see. You know, not everyone would and not everyone living with bipolar would. And why was it important for you to seek out those darkest moments and deal with them head on? I think it stems from the lyrics that first hit me in my teens. Just a lot of the grunge bands seem to have a little more of a sadder s s sound, which then kind of trickled into metal and especially hardcore. It's not that it so much to do with sad, but it was more or less like we're dealing with struggles and we're going to overcome them. Um, or maybe we're not going to overcome them. Maybe we're Alice in Chains and we're going to wallow in them. Um, either way, all that stuff spoke to me and... Um, so when I became a lyricist, I wanted to have that kind of realism and that kind of, at least what I perceived to be realism, and give that back. So in order for that to be possible, you have to drudge those things up and bring it up and, and deal with it. And then I noticed early on that by singing lyrics that I wrote of instances that I needed to get off my chest and then like repeating that over and over again it's similar to like a fighter or something where you're just getting better at at um or maybe you're playing guitar and your fingers hurt the first few times but a few weeks later they are calloused so um maybe it's a good way to callous emotions and or things traumatic events or things like that so if they come your way uh, as an audience member, maybe you can be a little more armed. Or if they come my way, um, maybe uh, I'm a little better equipped to deal with it. Cool, man. Cool, I love that. And, you know, I, I, I touched earlier on just on when I said anxiety. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of people who, 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 um, who deal with that. And there's something of a spectrum to it. You know, everyone experiences it and on different levels. And some experience the same levels differently. And when I hear you talk about, in the documentary, your more manic moments with bipolar, and, and then I watch how you deal with it, I look at your relations to others I've known who struggle, and you're so, <clears throat> sorry, you're so self-aware. You've searched and found a way to manage it and even make it part of your life as opposed to a hindrance on it. And I'm wondering, do you think that, you know, for bipolar, is there a spectrum there too? And, you know, do you think that there was a moment, depending on how you managed it at the time, that it could have escalated in a different, you know, less positive direction for you well absolutely just not knowing that I had hypomania was problematic because we were treating what we thought was just kind of depression I didn't know the signs of mania such as having elevated energy or racing thoughts I didn't understand that that was a, a symptom I didn't know that was so I would always if I'm talking to a doctor I'm, I'm t saying about the lows mm. <clears throat> so it wasn't until I kind of dealt with understanding it that I could be a little more introspective and self-aware. And we, we, I should probably say that that's super common. I'm also hypomanic, and they diagnosed me for bipolar as well at first, and then medication drove out the mania. And, you know, they, because people only go to a doctor when they're experiencing something that affects their life, right? right? And it, if you're hypomanic, most times, at least for me, I mean, some people have, like, paint the post office red and, you know, these addictive tendencies. But for me, I was just, like, a bundle of, of creative energy and would, would have a ton of physical energy. And so I thought of it as a positive. Um, but when you're depressed, nobody thinks about that as a positive, right? So that's what gets you in the door to see somebody, right? Absolutely. So, Nick, uh, while we're fortunate enough to have you here, would you, would you, um, what is, it would, what would your assessment be? Would you, would you agree that there's a spectrum for bipolar as well? 
Oh yeah, I mean, I I know people. I mean, I I, I did a film on on Derek, this artist Derek Hess, who's done a lot of you know famous artwork for metal bands as well, and he is completely on the opposite spectrum of, of me. I mean, he's more depressive. He describes it as sort of a heartbeat, like an EKG, right? Um, most people are in the middle, you know, and they're kind of flatlined, if you will, or their their highs and lows are pretty much in that spectrum. For somebody like myself, and I assume Mark, we go up really high and we shoot down, but when we shoot down, we don't usually shoot so down that you kill yourself. And then there's other people, like Derek, who are usually kind of low frequency, and then they shoot up high, and then when they shoot down low, they get real low. Um, and, you know, I, I personally, I think one of the reasons I wanted to do this film was because um, my way of dealing with it um, was both turning to music as a fan of Mark stuff and using, understanding that and then using these things like Mark did to, to self-medicate in a way. Cool. I love that. Uh, thank you for your insights, man. And now, you know, Mark, you cited that art and creativity have been huge sources of healthy mediums for whatever it might be going on inside you. And that uh, more recently, photography is a way that you can constantly create. And I'm curious to, has, ha, 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 to how, you know, the two, music and photography, aid the same thing, which is, of course, you. You know, Chimera is a united band of brothers tackling a range of different issues and so on. And, you know, you vent that to an audience and connect with them. And, but, and then photography strikes me as a much more relaxed, somber, but, you know, almost isolated kind of therapy through creati creativity. One where you don't have to go to those dark places also. Can you explain how the two both worked yet differed for you as a creative outlet? And do you ever miss going to those edgier corners of yourself as you did in Chimera? Um, yeah, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head with a little bit of a hint of yin-yang, right? So if uh, Chimera is my outlet for darker times, photography is my outlet for... for what I consider the beauty in life. And so it's cool for me to have that balance. I don't mind singing and screaming. I just don't feel like I've had much to say lately. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> until I do, uh, um, yeah, I'll just kind of remain focused on uh, other other things. When you approached Mark, it was, it was, of course, to, you know, to tell a story. Um, but as the director, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the of this of this documentary, visually, what way did you want to present this story, and what was your thinking behind how you wanted to uh, present it? Um, well, I I really am a big fan of high production value documentary because. I think a lot of times documentaries looked at sort of like the ugly redheaded stepchild of filmmaking, <laughs> like unfa unfairly so, um, because the barrier to entry is much lower. But since I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a director full time and I do narrative stuff, I, I took advantage of the crew that I had access to. And like I worked with the director of photography, Tyler Clark, who's a brilliant cinematographer and um he, we talked about really just kind of pushing the dark tones of the piece and making it like atmospheric and and surreal and sort of personifying some of the tones in the music with the colors and the you know the desaturation the sort of filmic kind of look we gave it uh, i also shooting like the the impossibility of reason stuff and all the the stuff from dehumanizing process through the the tv was a personal connection of mine. I mean, when I discovered Chimera, that record had just came out, and I would watch on a little 4.3 TV on it with a built-in DVD player at the end of my bed. So I really wanted to sort of, um, you know, just as a fan, kind of bring people to another time with the visuals, you know, kind of like make it a retro feel. Very cool, very cool. And in terms of the visuals, you know, this this kind of goes for both of you guys, and especially, um, you know, because you're friends and because you're close. Because for, for you, Mark, uh, you invite Nick and you invite, you know, uh, this team of people who are, are recording you into some of your, you, you know, your most you know positive moments when you're on stage and when you're doing your thing even in your personal life but you also invite them into some of your more intimate and vulnerable moments in the documentary also and i was wondering what was it like for you to have you know to have people in there kind of capturing that and nick how was that experience for you kind of trying to capture those 
those difficult but honest moments needed to tell this story and how did that how did that work for you guys luckily i have experience with documentaries because we've made a few Mm -hmm. so um right from the get-go with dehumanizing process basically the whole thought pro- uh, thought was that we were going to be open and candid and say what we felt and, and or thought and we continued that throughout all of our DVDs so by the time I had met Nick um, I'm just comfortable mm-hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it makes it easy by any means but it, it was definitely when you're asked good questions and uh, the team itself is competent and, you know, there's really no fear. You could tell right from the bat that what Nick's uh, vision was and it, it was going to be a, something that you'd want to open up about. And if we're going to have this conversation, let's have this conversation. So somewhat of a seasoned veteran, but also eager to talk about these sort of things just because I know how important they are. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, I, I echo that for the most part. I mean, the, my only concern, I knew that they had done a bunch of documentaries, but a lot of times when people have screen time and experience and they see like the wizard behind the curtain, if you will, and Mark being a big film fan too, you know, um, I, I was really kind of worried that um, a lot of people put on a front or put up things for affect. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, it's my job to sort of break that wall down from people. Um, I work, like, when I work with, like, actors, I'm working with an actor right now who's in a documentary sense. It's really difficult because she's always on, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I was worried about the performer and Mark coming out, I guess. That was my only concern. But he, to his credit, I mean, he really was vulnerable the whole time. I think it helped that we had spent some time together as friends for a little bit beforehand um, and talked and actually talked about these issues, you know? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like he he saw anything coming from left field that, you know, I was like, because with Derek Hess, when I did that film, he really, he he wears his heart on his sleeve and his face, but he, he bottles everything up. So with Mark, he was so forthcoming about these issues, it really kind of gave the piece the honesty and let the camera sort of disappear like, I'm really happy with some of the moments in there where he talks about, you know, in the intro of the piece where he talks about how how he felt, and he sort of, that, that's something that a lot of people can't articulate, and, you know, him being a vocalist and a wordsmith, it was really an awesome thing for this piece. Oh, great stuff, guys. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, throughout the documentary, we experience you, Mark, <clears throat> in a number of different settings, one of which was your reunion show with Chimera you know when you step back into the band for that first show in, uh, in seven years I believe it was yeah yeah uh, I, I wonder what it was like for you in regards to the conversation that we've been having here did it still serve you in the same way it once did kind of when you know revisiting that or, or was you know it great but you kind of found that I'm, I'm in a different I'm in a different place now this doesn't serve me in the same way yeah, that's a good, good question I think and it's kind of a little bit of a mix of the two. It, like, and the only thing that it didn't necessarily, knowing that it didn't necessarily serve me the same way was knowing that that was once that show was over, there was nothing coming down the pipeline. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit difficult to even after the show. It was such an incredible high, and then spend a year and a half working on it. That by the time it was over, it was pretty difficult for me to get my. Uh, feet back on the ground and I think when I met up with Nick a lot during those times you're actually getting me at a lower state so I think that was was cool high on the way up than anything we we did after the show I was definitely at a lower place Um, the uh, the production was so grandiose we spent six months uh just chris and i our keyboardist just editing video content and making sure we knew what gel colors we wanted light wise so they would match the video Mm -hmm. it was a 
really fun undertaking, and Chimera fans would be excited to find out a little funny story is that we've never played to a click track and for those people that don't know it's like kind of on a leash with a with a, a metronome right and all of our songs have um not all of them but the, a good chunk of them have various tempo changes throughout so it's we actually had to create maps for each song just like it would be in a recording studio and we had never played to a click track before until a week before the show and it was such a disaster of the first day <laughs> all the maps were wrong and we couldn't we couldn't get it together and it was such a a nightmare because oh my god we had just spent all this time doing this video and it it would have been fine like chris in the beginning was editing the video pretty loosely like you could just play it kind of free form without needing a click track but then i started editing it editing and then I was making very specific hits, like I want this explosion on this specific kick drum, yeah. this and this and this. And uh, he's like, I, I can't fucking do that. But <laughs> so we're going to have to play to a click track and uh, we're going to just have to figure it all out. And it was a nightmare. I, 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 man, I think Rob is still upset about it to this day. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. Because it's and he has every right to be because it's like yeah here we are first practice let's what's the most important thing not the video mm. but for Chris and I like I, well, I'm a singer I don't what the hell I don't need to practice uh, <laughs> it was go ray me fossil yeah like I'm not even doing any of that shit I just go in and start barking at people and hopefully it's on time. <laughs> that was a nightmare, and I'm glad, but we pulled it off. So to everybody, and I, credit. And I can say there too, there there was a lot of tension. We could feel it. The crew could, you know, the night of the show. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There was like, you know, I oh, remember yeah, Marky came up Mark to me. Disaster. Yeah. Yeah, Marky came up to me when the crew was just kind of willy nilly walking around shooting stuff beforehand. And you go, hey, make sure you don't step on these wires because if you step on these wires. And somebody accidentally unplugs something, it could screw up the whole show. And I was just like, okay, we won't stuff on the wires. So, I was, yeah, you could have cut my tension that day with a fucking knife. Like, uh, I, I, the click track continued to plague us at our sound check. We couldn't get Austin uh, to have the click track without interference. And so we had to hardwire him, and be like, nobody had the right cable. We missed our entire sound check, thus going out on stage with anyone ever in a band that kind of has to walk out cold without things sounding how they want them. Man, that's a, especially a big ass re that venue is just crazy reverb, so it bounced right back, and uh, just a nightmare. But we again, we pulled it off. Yeah, man, that was the show looked like sucked. it went down a treat. So nicely done. <laughs> We're, that's that's class. That's 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 almost twenty years of performance. We can pull it off. We and can, a little bit of Nick in there too, making it look awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. Well, it really was a great show, though. The sound was incredible, and the the mix that Rob did, I, I we got to give him credit. Like he Absolutely. did the, all that live stuff uh, with John Winter too. So like that, I mean, the, the, there was mics everywhere. They recorded that whole thing separate. So it was it was an amazing undertaking, and I can't believe we pulled it off. You know. Absolutely, yeah. The the I felt bad for the film crew because uh, yeah, I mean, you had to deal with our tension, and there was just so much that we were trying to cram in this one day. Like you got to get it. There was just a lot of pressure, and everyone everyone nailed it. Well, the other thing too with that is that was the first thing we shot. So usually in in doc we would build up to that moment like it is in the piece, right? We would shoot all the other stuff beforehand, but it came in so quick. I mean, Mark and I spoke in September together and I was out of town back in Los Angeles and I came in to, to visit my family after going to Brazil for a project for 10 days on Christmas Eve. So we literally started shooting right when I recovered from my jet lag and that was the first, literally the first production day of this whole piece was the day of the show. So you, it, you got us yeah. practicing. Yeah, that's right. We got the day before to practice yeah. right before. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
by that point we had kind of, we we had figured out the the uh, qualms of our click track disaster. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose just as an extension or maybe a little afterthought of, of that question when I was asking you, you know, did it serve you in the same way? Um, you know, you, you were you were so long without it, and you know, and you're still doing your own thing now. Um, you know, but but once upon a time, uh, you know, Chimera, you know, definitely seemed like a lifeline for you in many respects. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, while you still obviously, you know, hold it very near and dear, it, was there any party that kind of felt like, you know, I love this, I love what we did, and I, I love this night, but in the most respectful way possible, I don't need this anymore. It doesn't serve as that lifeline for me anymore. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel... That's, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, it's a much better bookend than the, what it was, how we ended. So in that regard, if that's the last thing we ever do, then wow, cool. And it's almost, I think, that there's this hesitation that no one wants to move forward because, well, like, how are you going to top that? So it was a, such a great experience. We broke all of our records in terms of finances and merch sales. We broke... The, the Agora, the venue, we it was the largest bar night in the history of the venue, and they've been open since the 60s. <laughs> That's so, an achievement. It was, uh, I mean, uh, eh, I'm good on another one, you know. No, nobody's really jumping. I mean, we keep having hot and cold moments where we'll all be on the same page, and then a week goes by and nobody feels that way anymore. Yes, so, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that it's because we've accomplished the things we've set out to do, and uh, for us to do something moving forward, we've got to top that in terms of performance first and foremost. <laughs> then worry about a click track in production. <laughs> Not the other way around. <laughs> well, finally, guys, I'm not going to keep you too much longer. I was just uh, finally, I want to ask you guys, Mark, what one of it's for you know, it's kind of a two parter. One's for you, and then one is definitely directed at both you guys. You know, when we talk about mental health and creativity, you know, you've done Chimera, you, you, you know, you've got photography, and as we said, they both served and served you in different ways. So I'm kind of curious whether it be, you know, photography, you know, the Chimera reunion, embarking on solo pastures musically or writing books, whatever it might be. Um, are you looking or are open to any and all art forms that might come your way in the future? And Mark, that's for you. And then for both of you guys, how would you advise people, given the documentary and, you know, how it is about, uh, you know, utilizing art to help with mental illness? Um, you know, how would you advise people listening to this who are struggling with those issues to go about finding their artistic vocation that might help them as it has you? Man, my short-term memory is not that um, great. That was such a long question. Can okay, you just go well, to? We'll start with you. We'll start with your one then, Mark. Um, are you open to you know? Oh yes, any and all art forms that come like, to my way. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, I, I, uh, I'm interested in getting into the side of movies. I'm a big movie movie freak. That's yeah. what led me to photography. So it'd be really cool to start utilizing my skill sets with music and my love of score and or uh, shooting things or writing stuff. And um, it's something I've been talking about for almost a decade, if not longer, some of, with some of my friends that actually do this for a living. And I'll give Nick and his team full credit that, and they're like inspiring to be around. And that's kind of one of those moments where I'm like, oh, I, I, I feel like I can jump into this uh, world a little easier than maybe I've had it in my head. I thought it would be, like, really, really difficult to put something together. And that doesn't mean what they did was, by any stretch of the imagination, not difficult. And that's not what I'm saying. But, <laughs> of course. But it, it just gave me a, a view of, like, wow, okay. It's, a, it's obtainable. I'm not there yet, but it's obtainable. So it'll be exciting to continue uh with nick and, and adventures and see maybe we can make some kind of horror movie together and you'll fun yeah you'll fun yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we really want to actually and mark and i are already discussing like you know even with this project we don't have uh we're we're writing away you're trying to write away 
that this could be an ex- a longer thing, either a feature or a series or something. Um, so I, I, yeah, I definitely want, I think that will be an opportunity for Mark and I to, you know, I mean, I, I think it was a great creative collaboration experience, me and him together. I mean, he, he's very knowledgeable when he's, and he understands photography, the light and all those things. So seeing Tyler shoot wasn't a far stretch for him. I mean, you know, I, I'm glad to hear that dude that we were able to, I don't know, be the, like the band that got you into music in that way, you know, I guess like right, just yeah, seeing it, you know, seeing it and seeing it's possible. Cause in this business, there's so many people who are discouraging and I've always taken the mindset of like the comp- competition is healthy and it's not a famine mentality. Like Mark's perspective just in, in his lyrics lyrics um, would be the same as a filmmaker. It's, you know, and I have something to say in my own way and, you know, too many people in our business are too com- too hateful and spiteful and selfish of each other's success. And it's yeah, well, it's I, I you know it's I think it's great. The more voices that are out there, the better. So yeah, that's such a weird thing too. Not to go on a tangent, but I get excited when my friends have an accomplishment. Like mm-hmm. I'm like double tapping that shit. You know, like man, fuck yeah, like on Facebook, yeah. mm-hmm. love. Like I want. I'm excited when people that I know uh, succeed. So yeah. I think I think that's a weird but unfortunate circumstance, especially like where you live, Nick, in LA. That a lot of people look right over your shoulder to see who's coming behind you. Yeah, it's so it's crazy. But you know, I don't do it for that reason. Exactly. I do it because I love it. So, and I think that's that's why we get along. So. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then finally, guys, the the second part to that. Um, absolute essay of a question. I apologize. <laughs> um, was, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you guys, you 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 produced a documentary. You, you've offered it up out there for 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 free. Um, you know, so I hope the 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 response has been you know has been positive and what you guys were hoping for. Um, the question then was, you know, how would you advise people listening to this or watching Down Again who are struggling with their own issues uh, to go about finding their own artistic vocation that might help them as it has both of you guys? You want to go, Nick? Yeah, hey, I'll take this one. Um, well, I, I've, I've said this many times. Um, it, it, even in the panel that Mark and I spoke at, I, I talked about, um, I think there's a view of mental health that... Um, is um, either a crutch or a disability. And I think if there's anything I want people to take away from this, it's that, you know, you if you embrace your mania or if you embrace why you're different, it can be an empowering perspective because you get deeper into the human condition than most people think about just by the nature of how your brain works if you're mentally ill. You're going to be critical. You're going to look deeper into yourself and ask those deeper questions. And as a creative person, that is a huge advantage to be able to tap into that when you can and ride that mania out or ride that depression out. Um, it's it can be a gift. And as I said in the beginning yesterday, or in the beginning of this podcast, I said, you know, <laughs> it's like being a superpower. It's like it's like having a superpower. It really is. I mean, if you, I did this thing in six months. I caught it. I you know I didn't make any money on this piece, um, and it, I did that with the passion and the, and the, the hypomania in full tilt. Um, but you know, it, it really, it does make a difference to have, to, it's all about how you view the, your illness. If you look at it as an excuse, um, or a way, Oh, what was me? Then, you know, you're not, it's not healthy. I think if you accept it, that you have an issue and embrace it and use it to your advantage, you can really kind of change everything, not just the stigma, but, your life, you know, you, I was a bad kid. I was in and out of mental hospitals. I was in juvenile correctional facilities. And as soon as I figured this out, everything in my life changed. So as far as like a specific creative field, I can't tell anybody that's really their decisions. But that little insight there is I hope what people take away from the piece. And I hope they take away from this discussion. You know, Mm -hmm. you can change your life. It's up to you, you know? Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Um, I wish you only the best of luck with everything you guys are doing with this documentary and beyond. And this has been personally one of my most uh, fulfilling interviews to date. So thank you guys for making it happen and for talking with me. Awesome. Pleasure meeting you, Carl. Thank you again. 
for the yeah thanks so much yeah my pleasure guys sincerely the pleasure is all mine you guys have yourselves a great day you too take care take care bye guys